The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We are joining you live here today in Salem, New Hampshire, and we have a special guest with us. She is actually a former client of ours, and her and her lovely dog, Griffey, are going to share their input on what our topic is today. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. Good job, honey. What is that tip, Jess? Well, today's episode is focused all on obstructions in dogs and obstruction surgery and everything else. So if your dog swallows something that isn't going to pass through them without an issue, you normally are going to have to have an obstruction surgery, which is quite costly. So our quirky tip of the day is if you don't, do not already have insurance for your dog, I would look into getting that. And Pet insurance is a very Yeah, it's a hot cheap, topic. Safeguard. It's a hot topic these days. So um, our special guest is Abigail Peck. She comes to us from New York. And uh, welcome, Abigail. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Where do you live in New York? What city? It's right in New York I live city. in Manhattan currently. And Abigail is actually a nurse in Manhattan. So she's had quite the few last months. I have. It's been a little bit crazy, but... When we, when we met her, uh, Griffey was a boot camp dog, and Griffey is this awesome golden. He has a light coat, but man, he's strong. Most dogs would come to the facility, and they'd like, I don't want to pee. I'm a little scared. Griffey walked out in the yard, and he was lifting his leg each way, like, I own the joint. He was a strong dog, but you were moving to Yellowstone, right, to do some traveling nurse stuff there or something? Yes. So I moved out to Yellowstone, and then I decided to take a full-time job in New York City after that. Um, like talk about two polar opposite things, <laughs> yeah. but so if you could go back now, knowing that we had the COVID coming and everything else, would you have stayed in Yellowstone or are you I'd glad this in worked? Wyoming? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that you're with us here today and hopefully we're getting to the tail end of it with New York. <clears throat> so we have, uh, some experiences with obstructions too, but recently Griffey has had some run-ins with corn cobs. We had heard. Yes. So in case anybody doesn't know, corn cobs are not digestible. <laughs> and For dogs. We have, um, oh, no people. Griffey decided that he, they're like the most delicious thing on the planet. So, so did he take it right out of your hand while you were eating or did you, he take it out of the trash? <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was, um, the first time it happened was at the end of June and w- I was cleaning up dinner and there was some corn cobs that we had eaten and we threw in the garbage can. And while we were cleaning, he just snuck right into the garbage can and like took two full, like eight inch corn cobs. Uh That's my boy. That sounds just like him. Yes. (laughs) And so I didn't even, I was like, I ran upstairs for a second and I came back downstairs and I noticed he was licking corn off the ground. And I was like, where did that come from? Like, we already ate the corn (laughs) and then we we went into the um garbage can and only counted two cobs and Uh, there were four to start with well at least you even had had the forethought to do that because most people would just be like oh random corn so then what happened after you noticed that two of the four were missing i googled it and freaked out because i found out that it could cause a small bowel obstruction and brought him immediately to the emergency vet Um, at the vet, they made him vomit like multiple times. Did they Um, just use peroxide or you don't know how that worked? Yeah. They, they used something called apomorphine, which is like, uh, it's like morphine, but they give it to dogs through the IV and it makes them vomit. Okay. So he pukes and pukes. Sounds pleasant. (laughs) Yeah. So it's, it might be a good thing to have on hand for a hangover. So he puked and he puked and puked and nothing came up or what happened? No, most of it came up. Almost all of it actually. Okay. So then nothing had to happen further or it did? They weren't, they they weren't done charging you. We could do an x-ray and just make sure. (laughs) Yeah. So they did an x-ray and sure enough, there was a large chunk of corn cob left in his stomach. Mm. Even after all the puking. That's my Griffey. That's how he does it. All right. Right. So then what did, what did that turn into? What did that look like? So it ended up turning into a endoscopy where they went down his throat. Oh yeah. And pulled um, it out. And they were able to pull it up. Yeah. Wow. Lucky. 
Lucky. That's uh, less than less intrusive yes. than the full surgery. Yeah. So we had a similar, well, not a similar thing. We, Scott's dog, Jimmy, I would say like four years ago now, um, was like kind of not feeling well. And we've had some instruction run-ins with our dogs, but I'll tell you the story about him because it relates to the scoping situation because I want to use the scope there. So, uh, I don't know. He just was off. He started feeling kind of sick, puking every now and then, but we didn't really know what happened. And I'm so like anal retentive that I was like, you know, what happened the other day to that avocado after we had the barbecue? Like we had Scott's son over. I couldn't remember who put away what. So I brought him in and I said, hey, let's do an x-ray and see what this looks like. Like see if there's something going on. I'm a little bit concerned. Nothing showed up on the x-ray and he would like still poop like a big thing with obstructions. Sometimes you didn't wait so much because you've known that this was going to happen with the corn cob. But a big thing with obstructions is like normally they can't defic like they can't poop anymore. So you're like, OK, well, you know, they must be obstructed. Well, he would sometimes go, sometimes puke, sometimes keep his food down. It was really strange. And uh, nothing showed up on that x-ray. The dog had lost eight pounds. He like was uh, sick. And like, this is like Scott's heart dog. Like Jimmy, I mean, I'm sure you even met Jimmy yeah. with, yeah. Jimmy. I was already checking breeders. <laughs> <a new> puppy. <laughs> oh my God. You, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> he sobbed when we found out he was finally okay. If you really want the truth. So anyway, I, don't, um, I won't admit to my, that. my breeder who we use and who I, I was talking to and asking medically about what to do. She said, I think you need to go in and do an ultrasound. So I went to the vet and I said, I want you to do an ultrasound on this dog. And she goes, well, I don't think we're going to see anything. Nothing's going to show up. I said, I don't care. I want you to do an ultrasound. So I sat at the vet for six hours. The dog was there because they were busy and they were going to fit him in. And sure enough, they do the ultrasound and there's this little round thing in his stomach. So I knew I was like, either it's the avocado pit that I was concerned about 10 days ago, or it was one of Gigi's little toys. You know, we have that Pomeranian, if you ever saw her. Um, yeah. and it turned out that, you know, they went in and it was the avocado and he was fine. But like, that was an instance that had I not advocated for him and like made them do the ultrasound, we could have lost him. But the endoscopy yeah. came up because I thought, well, it would be less invasive. Let's try to do it. But they were worried because depending on the size of the pit and the size of his throat, you don't want it to get stuck while you're scoping the dog, you know, because that's like a whole nother cluster. So. Right. Anyway, that was my, that was my contribution there. So you had the scare in June. It came up through his throat. Then now we had another incident, right? Well, let me ask right. you this. Have you considered a different type of trash can yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I, you know, I was at first, I was mad at my parents because that's where it happened. And like the garbage can was out. And I knew if I was there, like you guys know, because you taught me, I always have my eyes on that dog. Yeah. Like I'm always aware of him, but other people aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I was, but then I was like, it's not their fault. He's a stu he's the stupid one. Like he's the one going into the garbage. All right. So that was June. And now we've had another incident. No. Yes. So then he was like at, again, like at a sitter's house who watches him when I'm at work. And she texted me. She's like, you're not going to believe it. Griffey ate another corn cob. Oh, my God. So it was just one this time? <clears throat> it was one half of one. It was much less. Oh, Griff. So what was but required he, this time? What was required was he went to the emergency vet. They tried to make him vomit. They couldn't make him vomit. <laughs> so then after he failed that, they said they had to do another scope. So, but of course they couldn't do the scope at that location. So he had to be transferred to a different location with like a seriously, like an ambulance, like a dog ambulance. Oh my God. Was he like critical at that point? No, he was fine. It wasn't really, it was just like. Good way you know, to charge. The, it was a good way to charge the insurance. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> so then they do, um, they, they did the scope and, um, that was at probably four in the morning at this point. And he was in the scope for like two hours. I was freaking out. So I called and, um, they finally called me back. They were like, we tried for two and a half hours to get this corn cob up, but it's too big. We can't get it up. So he was, he was under general when they, when they transported yeah. him and during the scope. no. He not during the transfer, but once he okay. got there, they put him under. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like one of those games where you put the money in and you try, and the arm comes down to grab yep. the toy. Oh my god! <laughs> well, keep, I can imagine. Cop, corn cob keeps falling out of the clock. He probably feels like he has COVID. I'm sure his throat hurt after that. I know. Oh my Poor gosh! Dog. All right. Well, you know, I just wanted to say real quick. This is why 
when we board our dogs, I don't want the dog doing anything. They don't have to have any freedom. I just want them in the crate and fed and take them out to pee and poop and that's it because yeah, I'm just think, worried about people something People think happening. we sound crazy, but we're like, literally, like, keep them breathing. We don't care. <laughs> we're yeah. like, I'd, yeah. rather, I'd rather we're get like, the dog gets no exercise don't, and don't they're alive Don't play with them. Go. We don't care. And it's nothing against your sitter. I mean, like I said, Griffey is a strong dog and it's not easy to deal yeah. with him. But um, like, it's funny, Scott says that. And then we had a friend watch our dogs one time and we're literally like, put the dog on a leash, walk them through the house, let them go outside. And then this, we had a transfer of sitters for some reason. And then the girl texted me and she said, I'm sorry, but you know, when he went back to the crate, he grabbed this toy and then he brought it in his crate. And I was worried like that, you know, he might get aggressive. And this dog luckily didn't ingest stuff, but he ripped it up in his crate and had a big party. So I texted the first sitter and I'm like, what happened with the freaking toy? Like, what are we talking about? And he goes, well, it was just more fun to bring this down and then tug with him through the house till we got there. And then, you know, I just put oh it on the crate. Gosh. So then this other girl who had later worked for us and everything else is like not prepared. And the mountain was like, ah, my toy and like brings it in his crate. So yeah, it's hard, but like literally like crate them, <clears throat> keep them alive. That's all we freaking care about. Oh, and right. Abigail, I do want to say in your defense, that you two as a team had some of the best obedience I had seen in, in quite a while. Griffey was a very well-trained well, dog. Well, we haven't, we haven't seen him in a few months. No, but, <laughs> but I'm just saying that, you know, he trained really well. You guys put a lot of time and effort into becoming a team and we working did, yeah. together. But he is a strong dog, and he is a pain. He is a dog. He acts like a dog. So. He's like a dog that we like. He's a dog with character, and he's, he's a fun dog to have. And he was a great dog to have at Yellowstone, you know? Yeah, he was. All right, I want to talk and more. He is great, but yeah, he is I want to talk more about how this all uh, followed up and everything. But we have to go to break real quick. Hey, we go to break for Happy Howies. Do you still use Happy Howies? I do. Yeah, Griff loves his Happy Howies. All right, we'll he see you after the break. Happy Howies. Don't leave. We got to <laughs> chat more. Okay. Natural dog treats are made with real slow cooked beef, lamb, and turkey. Choose from deli style sausages, wolf sticks, jerky, burger treats, and our soft meat roll treats. All of our treats are available in bulk or in convenient resealable packages. And dogs just love Happy Howie's. They are made in the USA and available at thousands of retailers nationwide and online at happyhowies.com. Try Happy Howies today and save 10% with promo code QUIRKY10. Happy Howies. We're making it real. Are we back? Woo, we're back. We're back with a hard stop. Okay, uh, so we want to hear more. What do you want to hear? Oh, I wanted to find out uh, what kind of expense was involved in all of this stuff? Did and like follow-up care and just give us a little rundown after he came home. Okay. So after he came home, he had to wear the cone for two weeks. To stay away from the incision. Oh, yeah. Because I don't know if I told you, but after he wasn't able to get it out with the endoscopy, he ended up having to have his entire stomach opened up. Uh -huh. And they took everything. So... That was like, the incision was probably like six inches long. It was really, really big. Yeah. And did they put a zipper he, in there? <laughs> did, what? You, did they put a zipper in for future? They, yeah. No, they, they did <laughs> lots of stitches. So then he, um, I had to wash the incision and he had to be on pain medicine. It was literally heartbreaking. It was the most, worst thing ever for me. So I like felt so bad for the dog. Could he stay in the crate with the cone on or was that a problem? Yeah, he stayed in the, like he would go in the crate. He kept the cone on really well. <laughs> he learned, like he hated it at first. He wouldn't even move. Yeah. But then once he, like learned how to maneuver with it, he was fine. Maybe if he starts to turn into a jerk on the street, you could just bring a cone and just put it on him. Maybe that would inhibit him on the street. Yeah. There you go. He was better. <laughs> I just had a cone on my border collie for like a week because she was uh, oh, actually closer to a month because she was li licking her leg, but she doesn't bark in the cone. So I thought, oh, it's great. This is multi-purpose. The cones can be good. Yeah. So um, oh my <laughs> it's true. It's true. So he was, and then you have to keep him quieter too, right? Like that whole time he couldn't be crazy. Yeah, exactly. Like they didn't want him playing. They didn't want him going on long walks. So all we would do is like walk around the block. Um, I would keep him in the crate. Um, I just gave him pain medicine and gave him like GI medicine to yeah. keep his ass down. Um, and but he, he did really 
well with the like healing of everything. He seriously did super well. Good. So how long was it? 10 days to two weeks? What was it? What was the time frame? 10 days to two weeks until the incision was clean and like looked healed. Yeah. And then he could take the uh, cone off. And luckily you're a nurse. So you really kept everything all nice and tidy. I'm sure. I did. Cause even the girl who brought him out, she was like, if you let him get this cone off for even a minute, he can open up this incision and be back in surgery in no time. So she was like super serious. She's like, do not slip on this. Yeah. So because she also met the dog and she knew he was the kind of dog that would <laughs> check out what was going on right oh. away. Some dogs are super chill. Like you can just put a t-shirt on them and they don't care. Like it just really depends on the dog. My female had a laparoscopic spay and it was smaller incision, obviously, but a t-shirt was fine. It just depends on the dog and their tenacity and everything yeah. else. So tell us a little bit about the finances of how either the endoscopy worked or this worked or both, just so people get an idea of how serious these issues can be. Okay. So I wrote it down. Good girl. So the first time that he did it and he did not require surgery, it still cost me $1,903. That's a lot of money. Yes. And then the second time with the whole surgery and having to be, he also had to be in the hospital for 24 hours to watch him afterwards for pain and stuff and fluids. So the second time it was $5,298. Yeah. It's an expensive lesson, huh? Mm -hmm. So just in corn cobs, he's cost me <laughs> over seven thousand two hundred dollars. And you thought the you thought the training was expensive. Well, yeah. So what <laughs> I know the training was nothing compared to that. So proactively, what are you doing now to stop this from happening again? Well, literally, he's. I'm never having corn around him ever again. That's well, for summer <laughs> summer corn is over. So he was not in your care for the second one. You were at your parents yeah. for the first one, which was a different type of an environment, and the trash can was accessible to him. So, right. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there's some different protocols in place now for when you go to your parents or when someone watches this dog, I hope. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like I just need to be very explicit about making sure that he can't get into anything. Well, he really, this isn't like he's not, is he a trash dog normally? No, not really. Yeah. I also think it might be related to butter. Like as crazy as that sounds, like he's had butter recently. And I think the smell of the butter is on the corn. And I just yeah. feel like that's part of it. And the dogs do like it. I mean, we had a client, the guy with the Doberman. This this mm -hmm. is the guy too. Scott always tells this story. We said, you know, have the you, you know about the bad exercise, put the dog on the bed if somebody's gonna come over, tether the dog, yeah. anything else. So this guy texts Scott a week after the dog goes home and he said the dog ate the bed. <laughs> Scott said, how is that possible? Tell him what they said. What well, he said. yeah, because you're not supposed to leave, leave the dog alone when they're on their bed. You know, he was right, put, right, he put the dog on the bed and went to work. And oh. uh, he said, he said, well, you told me I could use the bed in place of the crate. So I put the dog on the bed when I go to work. And no. I was saying, you know, instead of having your dog in a crate, when you, you know, you're walking around the house, you can put him on the bed as a way to stabilize him if he's floating around too much, you know? But he, yeah. that dog had broken its leg before he came in for training. He ate the bed when he went home and then he had a corn cob obstruction, you know, a week later. So the corn cob thing happens with dogs. And yeah. honestly, my Malinois, he swallowed stuff his whole life. He would like eat a sock or my thong or like whatever it was like from college on, <laughs> or he'd get like one of the other dog's toys and swallow it. And he always puked it up, you know, like it always like was a thing where it was okay. And then, so I, I was careful, but I was like, whatever. He's had a lot of stuff in his life. He has this weird anxiety fetish. It'll be fine. Well, one time he was loose in our bedroom and he ate a sock and it didn't pass. And you're in your instance, both times it's been where like, you've known this has happened and you've taken, you know, proactive actions when your dog right. is sick and you're not totally sure why, like, I didn't know he had ingested that sock. Then now we're talking like a week of like, what's going on? Oh my gosh. And sure enough, we brought it in and it was just, you know, floating as an intestines back and forth. Like it was trying to clear. The guy literally said like, it's trying to clear, but, uh, he had a surgery too. And I would say both of our dogs, it was between 2,500 and 3,500. I think pr probably the overnight care for being in New York was a little bit higher for Griffey, but yeah. it's freaking expensive and it's a big lesson. And that clothing thing is common with dogs. Like that's a common anxiety thing and they smell stuff on it and they, you know, want to do that. 
There was a story, a Great Dane had like 19 socks in it at one point, like something oh crazy. Because they're like compulsively eating, you know, and doing this stuff. That's so, crazy. I mean, even us, and I'm crazy as can be, but I'm like, oh, it'll be fine. Oh, it'll be fine. But I tell you, after he had the surgery, then it was like, okay, you're never having access to anything ever again. You know what I mean? Because it's stressful. Yeah. And also, we're lucky, but like some of these dogs don't make it through like obstructions, depending on how they yeah. are. The surgery is so complicated that they have to lose part of their intestine. There can be necrotic tissue. Like they can get complicated also, and you can lose the dog. So that's terrifying as well. You that, know, that happens very quickly, relatively speaking, within yeah. just a few days. If you yeah. didn't know that the corn cob was in there, uh, you could lose him to any number of, you know, not just the obstruction, but yeah, the dying intestine or they go into sepsis, they get uh, that infection through their yeah. bloodstream. And, you know, not to scare everybody, but it's a serious thing. And you don't know how serious it is until you have to go through it. And then you're just like, oh, well, if they can just get surgery, it can be fine. But it doesn't always end up that way. And I have a story, just real quick, I'll paraphrase. There was um, a puppy that actually spent its first night with us um, in Massachusetts. It came from my breeder. It's a border staffie. He lives in the New England area in New Hampshire. And he had a doozy of a story. There was like an online auction for him to help pay for his medical costs, but he had gotten a knuckle bone on Christmas Eve from his mom, which is kind of like a marrow bone, but it's like uh, more circular and stuff. So anyway, she said while the, he was eating it, she heard this like weird sound, went in to see him. He didn't look well in his crate. You know what I mean? So she brought him to the emergency vet. They did an x-ray. There were only small pieces of bone like within his stomach. So they're like, he'll be fine. Just take him home. Here's some anti-nausea meds, whatever. Well, on Christmas morning, he wasn't eating. They thought maybe he had pneumonia. <coughs> it ends up that he had hit, the bone was actually in his throat. He had to have a surgery oh. because they had to take it out from, it got stuck in his throat. And then later when, hold on, I got to make sure I'm saying this all right. So it was, um, he had an exploratory surgery. It ended up being in his throat. Um, they were able to push the bone to his stomach, remove it that way. So that was like a typical surgery. And then he wasn't eating and he had to go to another veterinary practice. He got a massive infection at the surgical site. His abdomen was filling up. He like almost wasn't going to make it. It was super scary. And uh, they had to do a surgery for that and the infection and everything else. And then 11 months later, he had a bowel obstruction because of this whole problem. And he had to have another surgery. So it was a $20,000 journey for her to give this dog a bone on Christmas Eve. And like, this is how it goes. And, you know, it, wow. stuff happens and everything else. But she said that she had insurance, too. Um, and she paid, she was reimbursed like over 16 grand with the insurance, which, you know, when something like that happens, like that would cripple us. Like we, a $20,000 thing for us with the dogs is would like not go well. You know what I mean? So it just, it's really yeah. scary and we're not doing this as a fear tactic, but people should be made more aware of it because we've had dogs come in a lot and they like throw up a crustacean and I immediately text the owner and I'm like, Hey, like your dog puked this up. Like this isn't on me or like Halloween candy, like stuff that happened when they were home, but then they're now in our care. And I'm like making sure like if this becomes a thing, like I just want to make you aware of it, you know, you know pieces of leashes, things like yeah, that. Crazy stuff. Um, like crazy what, stuff. One thing I will say though, cause I talk about this with new people that come in all the time with a young dog and we do training, uh, when it has to do with counter surfing, getting in the trash, things like that, you know, and I tell the people, cause nobody likes to use the crate and I tell them you either put the dog on the bed, manage them and you got to keep the whole place perfectly clean, which you're not, especially a household with kids. You know, they're going to leave stuff out on counters. Uh, or you can create some avoidance to the trash can or the counters. And, you know, people don't want to do that either. But you pick your poison. You know, I mean, we haven't, and I'm talking about with the electric collar, you can create avoidance to the trash can where that dog will never go near the trash can again. And it's a front-end thing that you would do, but then you would prevent the dog from going in the trash and pulling stuff out, you know? But, but you the thing is with you, like you don't have a trash issue. It doesn't seem like some dogs compulsively go to the trash and they like get anything out of it. He just likes freaking corn. Well, hey, so I, it could I, be I, on the counter. Or it could be on the ground at a family party, you know? Yeah. With Griffey, I'd get a bunch of corn, butter it up <laughs> and I'd make it so he'd no never more, even look at corn again. No more corn. It's like, it's like <laughs> rattlesnake avoidance training, but yeah. corn avoidance training. <laughs> It's like Midwest. I know, and Midwest it's funny you say that because my dad was like, we need to train him uh, against corn. <laughs> and I was like, I know, but I'm not 
mentally ready for that well, yet. Really you guys though, know how I am. But really though, it's very easy to just manage the corn situation. If you have corn, you, you know, eat corn, he's in a crate, you bring it to the trash. I mean, it's not now that you know, now that you've had two of these yeah. things happen, you don't want to do the third time yeah, the charm I mean, route. And you can't blame the dog, Abigail. I mean, all dogs are scavengers. They're going to take what they can take and they're not being yeah. thoughtful about what they can digest and how this is going to affect their stomach. I'm not good about that. I still eat. I still eat pasta with spaghetti, uh, tomato sauce, and then I have a bad stomach for two days. Still eat it. Oh True. my gosh! How is he doing outside of all of his corn stuff? Is he doing okay? He is great, better than ever. He like, really is a great dog. Can't thank you guys enough. He's I, like such a good dog now. I feel so bad for you because I know it's terrifying with the obstructions, but it's so nice. Like. Once they get home and they're stabilized and everything seems okay, but it really does like make you take pause and be like, okay, like we need yeah. to make sure this never happens again. Cause as you saw, the scope was way chiller than the obstruction surgery, you know, and anytime oh, yeah. they have to open them up, the surgery, there's just so many more risks of that whole situation, you know? So I had yeah. actually with my Mal that swallowed that sock, he was coming out of anesthesia. So they stapled real quick rather than going through and like sewing them up carefully. And he had a bunch of staples in his stomach. Like not that ever came out, but like <gasps> they were like, like embedded in there just because it was difficult. You know what I mean? And his surgery site, like he needed to go on antibiotics. Like you never know what's going to happen. And it, it's fine. It wasn't something that killed him, but it probably wasn't for the best that there were staples within his skin. Near his you know, belly. I, I do want to add that with a dog like Griffey that has a lot of training and our dogs that are really well behaved and, and they're good to voice command. It's even harder because if the dog was untrained and a total pain in the ass, you wouldn't give them the freedom to get at it in the first place. You know, the dogs that are just crazy all the time, they wind up getting managed more. Dogs that are well behaved right. get more freedom. And then things like this pop up out of the blue and you're like, what the hell happened, you know? So you just yeah. got to keep an eye on him because he's, he's pushy. <laughs> well, and you're doing a great job of keeping an eye on him. Both times it's been in the presence of other people and that's not their fault either. But when you have tricky dogs, like, you know, if you can't, you know, the 24 seven monitoring that you can handle, but you can't expect other people to do that. I can't even expect Scott to do it with our dogs. Well, I keep yeah. him in crates. If, <laughs> yeah. if I'm taking a he shower, does. I put he the does. dog in a crate. He does. He just puts him in crates. He's like, whatever. I'll, I'll <laughs> I'd rather do that than have a freaking problem. No, you know? I know. It's true. It's true. Management is always the best policy. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us. And thank you so much for everything you've done in New York during such a trying time. Uh, we really like Abigail. She was one of our standouts. We like her dog too, but uh, she was a fun client to have. And it, coming back to New York when you did was a tough thing, and I'm glad you were there to help everybody yeah, through I hear it. All the restaurants are closed now in Manhattan, too. Hard to get a place to eat. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I'm ready for some fun again. Well, yeah. Come on up to Mass. <laughs> yeah. Come on up for a break. Yeah, you're, you're allowed in Maine. No, actually, we're living in Maine. New York can come to Maine, but Mass can't. So, yeah, come on up to Maine. We can go eat outdoors oh. and have fun. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. If you guys need anything from us, you can find us at studio at the quirky dog.com. Next week is going to be our year anniversary episode, and we are going to address dog bites. Uh, thank you again to Abigail and Griffey. Thanks, Abigail. We'll and talk to you. In the meantime, keep it quirky. <laughs> The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.